Many of you in the audience, I'm sure, are on the edge of your seats right now because you know that Gary Francione is about to take the stage. <laughs> He's an icon in the realm of animal rights and a pioneer of the abolitionist theory of animal rights. For those of you unfamiliar with his work, he's a distinguished professor of law at Rutgers University, and not only has he been teaching animal rights and the law for nearly 30 years, but he was the very first academic to teach animal rights theory in any US law school. He's authored many books, including his most recent, Eat Like You Care, which he co-authored with Anna Charlton. Ladies and gentlemen, it is with great honor that I present to you Gary Francione. I have been told I've got to remember two things. Um, I've got 60 minutes, and I'm not supposed to say anything political. <laughs> we'll see how that works. The title of my talk, um, in the program it says, the veganism is a moral imperative. But what you're actually going to hear is veganism is a moral imperative, but you're going to hear about the abolition, the pro, abolitionist approach to animal rights because I can't really talk about uh, veganism as a moral imperative without talking about abolition and what I mean by that. Um, and so that's what I'm going to do. And um, so this is my PowerPoint presentation. Um, the, I've got bad news, I've got good news. The bad news is that a, a, as of this moment, there is no vegan movement basically as a political movement, I'm sorry, I use the word political, I'm sorry, but there is no political movement for veganism, there's no social justice movement for veganism, okay? There is not. What there is is a lot of people out there talking about reducing suffering. We've got to reduce suffering. And we reduce suffering, veganism is a way, one way of reducing suffering. But, th but veganism is promoted along with cage-free eggs, crate-free pork, meatless Monday, all of that sort of stuff, okay? I believe, and I will explain why, I think that is not only not working, but I think it's a disaster. And what I would like to see happen is we develop a movement, a movement that exists outside of large organizations, okay? Uh, uh, you know, a, a grassroots movement that focuses on veganism as the moral baseline, veganism as a fundamental principle of justice, basically taking the position, you either are a vegan or you're engaging in animal exploitation, there ain't no third choice. And so this idea, this idea that, that it's okay if you're on a journey, think of how speciesist that is. If I say, you know, if we were talking about racism, sexism, misogyny, classism, if we were talking about any form of human discrimination that we believe violates the fundamental rights of humans, and I said, you know what, you know, like, I, I see this thing about people of color, and I'm sort of getting there, but I'm on my journey. So I still tell racist jokes, and I still engage in, 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 in discriminatory conduct against people of color. We would say, that's outrageous. But given the movement, and I hate to call it a movement because Movement implies going forward, um, and, and I believe that we are going backwards. As a matter of fact, this coming weekend, this coming weekend, not the one we're in, but the one next weekend, will be the 30th anniversary when 100 of us took over the Building 31 of the National Institutes of Health, the Neurological Communicative Disorders and Stroke Institute, and held that building for three days until we got then Secretary Margaret Heckler to look at videotapes that had been made by the researchers of horrible experiments that were going on at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, in which uh, 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 baboons were having their heads accelerated up to 2,000 times the force of gravity. We got Margaret Heckler to look at those, at those videotapes. Uh, she ordered an investigation and um, the sit-in, our occupation of the NIH ended, and the Penn Lab was closed. I was at the time teaching, that was 30 years ago. That was 30 years ago, and I think in many ways, we had a lot more energy then, and we had a lot more direction and vision then than we have now with this happy exploitation nonsense, this business that cage-free, crate-free, meatless Monday, all this stuff, it's pushing us backward, okay? So 
what I want to see us develop and what we are developing, and what's, this is the good news. The bad news is we don't have a vegan movement, not the, sort of, not the one I'm talking about. But we're on the, in the process of getting it started now. Um, we have a grassroots effort. It's going on all over the world. No organizations, no donate buttons. Nobody wants your money. We want your time. We want your energy. We want your passion. We can change the world. The world is vegan if we want it. We have to want it. We have to create it. We can create it. Think of what would have happened if 30 years ago, 30 years, I remember, I remember being in a meeting in the 1980s with the then leaders of the animal movement. And we were talking about the actual, the topic of the conversation was whether we were going to support the 1985 amendments to the Animal Welfare Act. And I, I thought we shouldn't do that. I thought it was a waste of time. I thought all it would do is make people more comfortable about vivisection because they would think it was more regulated. And I said, they said, well, what would you do? And I said, I would spend every time, every second of time, every cent of resources, every ounce of energy we have to creative, nonviolent, vegan advocacy. Once you go vegan, everything changes. Until you go vegan, nothing changes. And what do we have 30 years later? We've got a, a movement that is far more reactionary, far more regressive, far more conservative than what we had 30 years ago. So I don't think it's going forward. But we're going we're gonna to change that. We're going to change that with your help. With all of us, we're going to do this as a communal effort. And it's not going to be a matter of organization, of, of you know, organizations with donate buttons. The only thing you can contribute that matters is you. That's the only thing that matters. Your money is irrelevant. The problem has never been money. The movement has got tons and tons and tons and tons of money. Money is not the problem. The problem is vision. We don't have a vision, but we're developing one. Okay? So that's what I want to talk to you about tonight. Okay. All right. This is where the abolitionist movement comes in. It's a grassroots effort. It's anarchical, I guess, for want of a better word. Um, it's an anarchistic sort of movement. It happens outside of organizations. And, and um, it is focused on one and only one primary idea. Veganism is a moral baseline. It's a moral imperative, OK? that there is no third option. You're either vegan or you're an animal exploiter. Now again, you know, I don't want to sort of like sound accusatory here, but, the, but no, no, but seriously, but seriously, you know, it's, and, and, and I'm going to be talking about a lot of groups tonight, and I want to be clear on one thing. I don't, I'm not questioning these people's sincerity or anything. I, I know a lot of these people personally. I just think they're wrong. And I'm going to explain why I think they're wrong. But, you know, it's not a question of thinking that they're bad people or that they're evil people, or whatever. We're just doing different things, OK? We're just doing different things. I worked with a lot of these organizations. Back during the time of the NIH 30 years ago, I was involved with PETA. By the way, the University of Pennsylvania lab got closed. It was eventually closed. They then started the experiments using guinea pigs and other animals that were not as, as appealing as baboons. But even though. I represented the people who occupied the NIH, even though I represented the activists who were trying to get the lab closed, even though I participated in the efforts to get the lab closed. I still got tenure at the University of Pennsylvania, which just goes to show if you're a white male and you have your ticket stamp, you can get away with anything. So I really recommend, if you've got a choice, always come back as a white male. The world was made for us. OK. Um, all right. Let's talk about the fundamental tenets of the abolitionist approach to animal rights. The abolitionist approach maintains that all sentient beings have the basic right not to be treated as the property of others. We have all sorts of disagreements about what rights that humans have. I mean, we can have all sorts of dis discussions about what rights should humans have, OK? And, but we all agree on one thing, I hope, and that is that slavery is wrong. Why do we think that slavery there's lots of bad stuff in the world. But why do we think that human slavery is particularly wrong? The reason why we do is because if someone is a slave, that, that human is not a person. That human is not a being who matters morally. That human does not have 
any inherent or intrinsic value and only has extrinsic and external value, okay? That human is outside the moral community altogether. That human only has economic value. And we recognize, however much we might dis disagree about whether certain sorts of treatment constitute discrimination, and there are disagreements about those sorts of things. We all agree that slavery is bad. We all agree that slavery is wrong. And we agree that it's wrong because if you're a slave, you're outside completely, outside the moral community. And we also, we recognize that every human, every human, whatever his or her characteristics are, however smart they are, however beautiful they are, whatever their, however unintelligent they are, but we all believe that whatever your characteristics are, okay, whatever, whatever, go, whatever sort of mind you have, whatever sort of physical appearance you have, whatever sort of ability you have, that you have one fundamental right, at least, and that is the right not to be a chattel slave. Because if you are property, then you have no value except that which others give you, okay? And so we recognize that, that all human beings, whatever their characteristics, all of them have that, have that right, okay? The same thing must hold true for animals. If animals have any moral value, if they're members of the moral community, they have to have one right. They have to have one right. Their interest in their lives has to be protected, even if it would be good for us consequentially to, you know, even if we would benefit from exploiting them, okay? They have to have the one right not to be treated and used as property. That's the only right. When I talk about animal rights, I talk about it in the negative sense of saying that animals have the right not to be property. I don't really talk about affirmative, I mean, I, I mean obviously, animals don't, you know, sh it would, make, it would make no sense to talk about giving animals the right to vote, for example, although we might have a better political system if we gave them that. But, but it, you know, it doesn't make a lot of sense to talk about um, animals, animals giving, having the right to vote or the right to drive cars um, or whatever. But if, they, they, if they're going to matter, people, if they're going to matter, then they've got to have the one right not to be used as property. The problem is, the problem for others is, once you recognize that one right, then you've got to abolish animal exploitation. It's not a question of regulating it. You've got to abolish animal exploitation. You've got to abolish institutional uses of animals, all of which depend on, rely, and assume that animals have the status as prop, that they're property, that they're things, things that we can use, okay? And so what we need to do is to, if we recognize, and this is the abolitionist, the abolitionist position, the abolitionist philosophy, is that animals, all sentient beings, by sentient, all I mean is subjectively aware, perceptually aware, okay? Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that later, but, but, but sentience is simply the characteristic of being subjectively aware. Having some sort of mind, whatever it is, however minimal it is, there is someone there who cares about what happens to him or her even if no one else does, okay? All right, so any, all sentient beings, if they're going to be members of the moral community, if they're gonna be members of the moral community, they have to have the right not to be used as property, but once you recognize that right, you pull the rug out from all institutional exploitation, you're morally obligated to seek the abolition and not the regulation of animal ex exploitation. The abolitionist position, this is where it sort of like gets a little tricky um, uh, in terms of um, people getting upset with me. Um, and that is the animal, the abolitionist position um, rejects the idea that we ought to be, you know, animal welfare campaigns and single issue campaigns, we reject those, okay? Animal welfare campaigns, giving bigger cages, you know, like we, we, we have a campaign 
and the campaign results in an agreement by some, you know, an agreement by some corporation to give larger cages to animals phased in over a period of 273,000 years. Um, they're going to give them larger cages, at least some of them, perhaps, maybe. Um, but, you know, the, these sorts of welfare campaigns, single issue campaigns are things like, you know, anti-fur campaigns, anti-foie gras campaigns, things like this. You know, these are single issue campaigns. We're going to talk about the problem with these things. Um, if the animal, well, the animal welfare position is immoral in my judgment. That is, if it's morally wrong to exploit animals, if it's morally wrong to exploit them, if we have accepted that animals have, a, have this right not to be used as property, okay, if we accept that right, then exploiting animals is morally wrong. This is like not rocket science. It follows logically. You accept the right that they have, that they, they have a right not to be used as property. It follows logically okay, that we should not be exploiting them. So if we shouldn't be exploiting them, we should not be promoting their humane exploitation because that's what welfare campaigns do. Welfare campaigns basically involve they take the position that what we, they, they seek to build coalitions Okay? Coalitions that may involve vegans, but involve lots of non-vegans. And so the people say, okay, fine, well, I eat eggs, but I agree that, you know, chickens should, that hens should have more space. So we, we develop these coalitions, which then promote welfare reforms like larger cages or cage-free. I don't know whether any of you all have seen a cage-free operation. It's one big cage. This idea that this is like some sort of humane innovation is complete nonsense. It is complete nonsense. Cage-free eggs are nothing but hens in a large cage rather than in smaller cages. But they're all still walking over each other. They're all still pecking each other. They're all still defecating on each other. They're still urinating on each other. It's hell. It is torture. And so this idea that this is, this is an innovation, this is a good thing we got to support, nonsense. If exploitation is wrong, we should not be promoting humane exploitation. Again, look at it in the human context. If you decide that slavery is wrong, you don't promote, you don't say, well, you know, slavery is really wrong. It's a fundamental violation of rights. So what I'm going to campaign for is a rule that says you can only beat your slaves nine and a half times a week and not ten times a week. Everybody would, everybody would recognize that as idiotic. But when it comes to animals, it's all of a sudden great. Oh, great, great. Well, you know, Costco has agreed that it's going to phase in over the next four million years. They're going to, you know, they're going to get rid of their cages. And the answer is, what are you talking about? If it's wrong to exploit animals, then it's wrong to promote the humane exploitation of animals. I mean, it's just like, look, look at any human context. I mean, rape. Rape is a serious problem. I mean, I know, I know it is illegal, but so what? It's illegal. It's illegal. It happens all the time. You know, one out of four women who make it to college age will have been the victim of a rape or an attempted rape. That's, in, that's, that's sick. That's truly sick. Now, a lot of those rapes are violent, really violent rapes. That is, it's not just the battery of the rape, but the victim is beaten, the victim is tortured. There's other sorts of stuff that goes along with the battery of the rape. Now, we all recognize this, or at least we should recognize this, that this is a serious problem. But I don't hear anybody say, let's campaign for humane rape. Let's really, let's campaign for the idea that, you know, that we should be promoting, you know, Rapes that don't involve beating the hell out of somebody in addition to raping that person. Nobody would think that that's sensible. But when it comes to animals, because in certain ways we are still speciesist, when it comes to animals, we say, no, 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 it's okay. You know, let's, let's go for the less suffering. Less suffering is always better than more suffering. Duh. That's like a no-brainer. You know, that's a no -brainer. But that doesn't answer the question about whether the exploitation is morally justified or not. It's better if you're a slave owner, beat your slaves nine times a week rather than 10 times a week. But the other nine times you're doing it, it's still morally wrong. It's still a violation of fundamental rights. It's still wrong, okay? Same thing with animals. So we should not be promoting um, these uh, humane uh, things because they're useless. They're actually, they're actually worse than useless. They're counterproductive. The animal welfare position, now you understand. Maybe you understand why. Um, the large animal rights groups, as, as likable as I am, they don't like me. Um, I know, I know, this comes as a surprise to you. I know, I know, I know, but they don't, they really don't. They, they say I'm divisive, they say I'm terrible, evil, and stuff like that. All right, 
um, the animal welfare position is based on the idea that animals' lives matter less than the lives of humans because we are more sophisticated mentally than they are, cognitively than they are, so that their, our lives matter because we're self-aware. Their lives don't matter because when we kill them, they don't know what they're, they live in an eternal present. Well, if you kill the animal, if you give the animal a decent life and you kill the animal in a relatively painless way, you haven't really harmed the animal because the animal doesn't have a sense of his or her life. This is the position that Jeremy Bentham articulated several hundred years ago. It is the basis of the animal welfare position, that animals don't care that we use them, only care about how we use them. That is the position that Peter Singer maintains now. That's Singer's position. You know, I've read, I, I always meet people who, when I say this, they say, really, does Singer really say that? I have animal liberation. You may have animal liberation, but you haven't read it. Because if you read animal liberation, if you read it, he says it pretty explicitly, that, that animals, the, that, that what matters is that we, that we give animals a reasonably pleasant life and a relatively painless death. Okay? But that he does not think, you know, he, he, he thinks that maybe non-human great apes maybe have a self-aware, maybe dolphins are self-aware, but basically the animals that we exploit on a daily basis, they're not self-aware. So their lives matter less. And this is the position, I believe, that has been embraced by the animal movement in this country. They've embraced, it's Singer's, it's Peter's movement. You know, it is Peter Singer's movement in that he maintains that it's not how, it's not that we use them, it's how we use them. They're sentient, so their interests matter, but their interests don't matter as much as our interests, and there are certain interests they don't have, okay, because they are cognitively deficient. They live in an eternal present. This is the philosophical position of the animal welfare movement, that animal lives matter less. This is what the large organizations have adopted. Look, I worked with Peter very, I, I, I believe in my heart, I don't, I mean, I know Ingrid very well, I knew Alex very well, I, I know some of the people who are still, but I'm sure, the, you know, 99% of the people who are there are people I've never met. But the bottom line is, I'm sure that when they kill those 95% of the animals that they take in at their Norfolk shelter, I'm sure they do as good a job as they can do, as quote, a humane job as they can do in killing those animals. But it is wrong. It is always wrong to kill a healthy animal. It's not euthanasia. It's not euthanasia because euthanasia is when death is in the interest of the being you're killing. Death is never in the interest of a healthy being. And when you take in as much money as PETA takes in every year and you kill any animal, shame on you. That's wrong. That's absolutely wrong. And so, but... But I believe, I mean, look, do I think that they're sitting there saying, you know, I'm being evil? You know, we're being evil by No, I'm sure that they have bought into Singer. I actually wrote an article about this um, last year. But I'm sure that they're buying into Peter's view, Singer's view, that um, animals, if you, kill a, if you kill an animal and you kill the animal in a relatively painless way, you're not harming the animal because death isn't a harm to the animal. The animal does not have a sense of his or her life. She has no interest in continued existence. She only has an interest in not being made to suffer pain, distress, fear. But she has no interest. She has no interest in her life. I think that that's wrong. As a matter of fact, I think that's incredibly speciesist. And when I get to that section of the talk, I will explain why. There's actually a very simple reason. All righty. Um, the animal welfare position is effect ineffective. In addition to being immoral, it's useless as a practical matter. Why animals are property. They only have extrinsic or external value. Okay? The only time we protect their interests is when we get a benefit from it. This is property. They're property. Okay? So... We expend resources on protecting their interests when we get a benefit from doing so. So if you look, for example, in 1958, okay, I was alive actually back then. I was actually a small child about to start school. And um, so, that's, so it wasn't that long ago. And if anybody says, well, 1958, uh, just remember you're going to make an ageist comment, which is going to offend me. Um, <laughs> and so um, in 1958, they passed the Humane Slaughter Act which required that large animals, cows, uh, sheep, pigs, calves,
be shackled and hoisted, I mean, be stunned, rent, you know, be stunned before they're shackled, hoisted, and cut. Now, if you've ever been in an American slaughterhouse, you know that that is, that is a rule which is observed, you know, as an exception rather than the rule because lots of animals get to the killing floor still moving. However, the thinking was, if you read the legislative history of that act, what you see is Congress saying, look, we should stun them because if we don't stun them, they incur a lot of carcass damage and they injure workers. You got a 2,000 pound cow hanging upside down because what happens is when they put the chain around their leg, okay, they, they pull them up and it breaks their pelvis because, you know, I mean, their legs, I mean, it, it, their pelvis breaks, okay? So they move, they're moving around a lot. If they're not, if they're not stunned, okay, they are moving around a lot. They, they crash into workers, they injure workers, and they incur carcass damage. They, 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 there, they thereby decrease their value as meat, and they injure workers. So that's why we have a rule, that, and that's why it didn't apply to chickens. Because people thought, what the hell, chickens are, you know, I mean, they can move around all they want, and they're not going to incur carcass damage, they're not going to, you know, they're not going to work, injure workers. If you read the position papers that my friends at PETA and HSUS have, have been publishing, arguing in favor of controlled atmosphere killing, rather than the way that they presently kill chickens, you see the arguments they make are economic arguments. They basically say there's still a lot of carcass damage, which there is, there's a lot of carcass damage in terms of of the present way in which animals are killed. And there are still worker injuries because you're dealing with electricity, you're dealing with, with knives that are whirling around and stuff like that. There's still a lot of injury in that, in that industry. And so if you were starting a chicken slaughterhouse tomorrow, you'd be insane not to use controlled atmosphere killing because it's an economically much better thing to do. But this is what animal welfare reform is. It's basically making animal exploitation more economically efficient. That is not moving in an incremental or any other way. It's not moving animals away from the property paradigm. It's further enmeshing them in it. Okay? So, so it, it, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. I mean, the best that it can do is to create niche markets for people who have got extra money and who can go to, uh, to places like Whole Foods and buy their indulgences. Oh, I buy, today I got some chicken, you know, rated animal welfare, rated number three, and I feel better. Let me pat myself on the back because I bought humane chicken, okay? So this is, this is the best that animal welfare reform can do. This is not doing anything, people. I mean, the idea that, you know, because a lot, of, a lot of people who are involved in these organizations, they say, well, we've got to do something. This is nothing. This is worse than nothing. Because what you're doing is making people feel more comfortable about animal exploitation. You're giving them an excuse to continue exploitation. That's not helping anything. That's not moving things forward. All that's doing is further enmeshing, further, further funda making fundamental the, pro the, the whole principle of animal exploitation. It also makes partners. The whole animal welfare thing makes partners between, out of, you know, it creates a partnership between animal exploiters, institutional animal exploiters, and animal organizations. Let me give you a few, like two million examples. Um, all right, all right, okay. All right, this is a, uh, uh, you have to take my word for this because you probably can't read it. But you can come up and you can see my printout to see I, I ain't fibbing to you. Um, this is um, a letter. I believe this is historically one of the worst, thing that's ha one of the worst things that's happened this, uh, re in recent years. This was a letter that was written by Peter Singer to John Mackey, Chief Executive Officer of Whole Foods Market. Dear John, the undersigned animal welfare, animal protection, and animal rights organizations would like to express their appreciation and support, appreciation and support for the pioneering program of happy exploitation that now manifests itself when you go to Whole Foods and you see animal welfare level one, two, three, four, five, that started here, people. And that started with the blessing of the father of the animal rights movement, Peter Singer, signed on to by, among others, Compassion Over Killing, Farm Sanctuary, Humane Society of the United States, People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, Mercy for Animals, Vegan Outreach, Viva USA. I'm sorry. I think that's obscene. I really do. And I mean, I, I don't, it, 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 and if, if it makes, if it means that I'm being divisive by saying 
that this is nonsense, that this is offensive, speciesist nonsense. Then I'm divisive. Because I don't, know, I don't know how else to understand that. Maybe it's my limited intelligence, but I do not know how else to understand that. When, when you have all of these groups saying to John Mackey and saying to Whole Foods, which is basically one of the most insidious organizations, because what it exists to do is to make people feel better about continuing to exploit animals. That is one of their primary goals. Is to, is to make it, make what we are doing, making the, the violence that we perpetrate on animals on a daily basis, sanitizing it and making it morally furry, morally acceptable. That's what this sort of thing does. And I believe that in 2005, when Peter, and, and actually Whole Foods had that on its website for some period of time, and and Singer was asked about it, about the fact that, that Whole Foods was using this in its promotional uh, uh, efforts. And Peter responded, well, I didn't write it for them to put in a file drawer. We support these efforts. All of these organizations, all of these supposedly animal rights, this has got nothing to do with animal rights, people. Nothing to do with animal rights at all. Okay? All of these groups supported that. I think it's shameful. Um, here is, this is, um, one of, this is a Whole Food that's near my house. Um, let me just get some water here. This is a Whole Foods near my house. There's a sign outside, Whole Organic Chicken. It's really sort of sad, you know? Your life is worth $1.99 a pound. Isn't that sad? Um, and so, Whole Organic Chicken, and then it says, Global Animal Partnership, Animal Welfare Rating 2. It's really sort of sick. You get to buy your level of torture. You know, well, I'm not, I got, you know, I, I, I want to I wanna go to a, an extra movie this week, so I think I'll buy level two rather than level four. I mean, I, I'm sorry, but I think that that's like sick beyond belief. However, um, so Global Animal Partnership. Now, if you go to Glo Global Animal Partnership, this is the organization that, that grew out of Mackey's Animal Compassion Standards. And this is an organization that formulates these happy exploitation steps. And, uh, you know, one, two, three, four, fifth down is Wayne Passell, chief executive officer of the Humane Society of the United States. Okay? And so um, we have here HSUS, Wayne Passell, leader of the largest, quote, animal organization in the country, on the board. You have all of the groups supporting it. You got Wayne on the board of the Global Animal Partnership formulating standards for happy exploitation. Don't tell me it ain't a partnership. Now, lest you think I'm being unduly harsh to HSUS, this is an award that my friends at PETA gave, H gave uh, Whole Foods. Okay, an award for being the best animal-friendly retailer. There's John Mackey. There's John Mackey on the cover of Veg News. They gave him an award too. If you could see the picture, you could see cheese in the background. This is Veg News. Now, I mean, I grant you, you know, it's not really a, Veg News is like People Magazine for vegetarian things. But I mean, so I'm not saying that, you know, that it should be, you know, anything more sophisticated. But that's pretty bad when, you know, you're put, this guy, I mean, look, you know, I'm sure, you know, I've never met John Mackey. Um, but, but John Mackey is, is a primary mover, primary proponent of this idea that we can exploit compassionately, okay? And he's on the cover of Veg News. Here's, uh, here's uh, my good friend Ingrid Newkirk on the Bell and Evans. Bell and Evans is a chicken supplier. And here's Ingrid Newkirk saying, this is a quote from Ingrid. Bell and Evans shows that animal welfare and good business can go hand in hand. And by listening to consumer wishes, Bell and Evans has set a new standard for the chicken supply industry. Now, when you have PETA, when you have Ingrid Newkirk saying Bell and Evans is setting a new standard for the chicken industry, what does that, what message does that give to people? And I have to laugh when I hear Ingrid say, oh, we don't support happy exploitation. Nonsense, of course you do. That, is, that can only be understood. Members of the public who see that say, hey, I should buy Bell and Evans. I care. I'm a compassionate person. I'm a good person. I should buy Bell and Evans chicken because Ingrid says they've set a whole new standard. So if PETA says they've set a whole new standard, and PETA's the radical group, if PETA says that they've set a whole new standard, then, um, 
you know, isn't that a good thing? This is what I mean, partnership with animal exploiters. And here's like, here's, here's the Humane Society giving uh, uh, an award and uh, praising Aramark. Aramark is a big institutional um, uh, food uh, supplier. And, and uh, you know, they, went, they, they said that, you know, by um, the 27th century, they're going to have cage-free eggs. And so uh, uh, HSUS got or, all orgasmal over that, very excited, and started giving them all sorts of awards. Um, here we have certified humane, raised and handled. This is, a, this is a, one of the labels. There's a whole bunch of happy meat labels out there, one of them being this, Certified Humane Raised and Handled, okay? HSUS is involved with this. The ASPCA is involved with this. The newspaper, uh, Animal People, supported. I mean, this is basically a, a collective effort involving a lot of different organizations, and they put labels on products. Um, here's... Um, Humane Farm Animal Care, that's the organization that sponsors this, is the leading nonprofit uh, certification organization dedicated to improving the lives of farm animals and food production from birth through slaughter. The goal of the program is to improve the lives of farm animals by driving consumer demand for kinder and more responsible, kinder and more responsible, I'm sorry, that's obscene, um, farm animal practices. When you see the certified humane raised and handle label on a product, you can be assured that the food products have come from facilities that meet precise objective standards for farm animal treatment. Don't tell me this isn't promoting animal exploitation. I mean, I have to laugh when I hear animal people say, we're not support, we're not promoting animal exploitation. You sure as hell are. That's exactly what that is. It's promoting animal exploitation. There is no other way to understand it. Um, it's not just here, it's all over the place. This is, the, this is um, freedom food from the United Kingdom. Um, we, know this is, uh, we know that a majority of people, more than 70%, are concerned about farm animal welfare. But knowing what to do can be hard. Yeah, like going vegan, really hard. Um, so we work with retailers, supermarkets, convenience stores, farm shops to increase the, vis the visibility of freedom food at the point of sale. We also work with food brand chefs, restaurant owners, and food service companies to encourage them to buy from freedom food approved farms or to help them bring their suppliers up to freedom food approved status so it's easier for us as shoppers to choose the higher welfare option. This is promoting animal exploitation. Here we have HSUS. This was off of their Facebook site. HSUS giving a $1 off crate-free bacon from Applegate. And this was on HSUS's Facebook site with the expression, breakfast just got tastier. This is Joe Maxwell. Joe Maxwell is a pig farmer. He's also a vice president of the Humane Society of the United States. They have a pig farmer as an officer of their organization. Now look, I don't, I mean, I'm not saying that these people are, I, I just think this is wrong. I'm not saying that they're bad people. I don't know Joe Maxwell. I, I wouldn't do that. I think what he's doing is wrong. I think it's really wrong. I think it's a violation of fundamental rights. But, you know, I mean, I'm not, I'm not you know, judging Joe Maxwell's heart. I have no idea what, the, what goes on in the guy's heart. What he's doing is wrong. And what we are doing by supporting these organizations is also wrong. If you are supporting HSUS, if you're supporting PETA, Mercy for Animals, Compassion Over Killing, any of these organizations, you are promoting and supporting this sort of nonsense. All right. Um, what do welfarers say? Well, they say, we have to do something. Sorry, this is not something. Okay? I agree we have to do something. What we need to do is be relentless in engaging in creative, nonviolent, vegan advocacy every second we can do it, and every way that we can do it. We're going to talk, Anna and I are going to talk tomorrow about doing creative, nonviolent, vegan advocacy because it's not as hard as you think it is. We're all going to do it in different ways. We all have access to different groups and stuff like that. Um, so, you know, but, but we all have access to other people. We can all change the world, you know? I mean, if everybody persuaded, you know, one or two other people to be vegan, if all present vegans persuaded one or two other, I worked this out actually on, my, on, on one of, the, one of the, the posts I wrote on abolitionsapproach.com. We could have the world vegan in a matter of like 12 years. So I mean, if each of us spent our time educating others about the importance of veganism, not veganism as a way of reducing suffering, but veganism as a fundamental principle of justice, we could change the world. We will change the world but we're not going to do it with that stuff. Um, we have to do something. Well, animal welfare reform is not doing anything. Um, 
this is similar to in, in, incremental improvements in human rights. No, it's not. We didn't get rid of slavery because we made it more humane. We got rid of slavery because there was a paradigm shift and people, a large number of people came to recognize that owning other humans was a really obnoxious, horrible, morally repulsive idea. That's the only way we're gonna get rid of animal exploitation. We're not gonna get rid of it by making it more humane. All we're gonna do by making it more humane is making people more comfortable about animal exploitation. We need to take baby steps, yes, baby steps. I, if, I have, if I ever, if I hear again, baby steps. If you really want, if, you, if you're like one of these welfare people and you want to get rid of me, come up to me and say, but shouldn't we be taking baby steps because I have cyanide in my pocket, I'm going to drink it and I'm going to kill myself because if I hear the baby steps thing one more time, you know, that's it. I just can't take it, you know. I'm getting old now and I, I just, I've, I've heard the ba baby steps. Baby steps are for babies. Okay, they're for babies, okay? We're adults, we're adults. Um, let's take, let's take, you know. And, and actually, you know, come to think of it, to call these things baby steps is an insult to babies because, because, because even a baby step is a small step forward. These are big steps backward, okay? So don't insult babies. Don't be, a, don't be an adultist um, and insult babies, okay? Um, Everyone's on a journey. That's another one. I, you know, that's another one that I just makes me want to vomit. This idea that, you know, I'm on a journey. I don't care whether you're on a journey, you know? And this idea, you know, people always say to me, were you, were you born a vegan? And the answer is no, I wasn't. You know, I was born, a, 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 I hated vegetables. I ate meat, you know, for, for the first chunk of my life, okay? I've been a vegan now for 33 years, all right? And I'm not dead yet, so it can't be unhealthy for you. But, um, <laughs> Um, and interestingly, interestingly, I teach in a university. I have students sneezing on me all the time. You know, I mean, really, they all get sick. They're all walking around like, the, like dead people. And, and I cannot remember, uh, first of all, I have more energy than the people I teach, and they're young enough to be my grandchildren. And secondly, I cannot remember the last time that I was sick. I just can't remember the last time I had a cold or I had, I, I, you know, I don't get flu shots because they have animal products in them. But I also haven't had, I also haven't had the flu in, you know, I, I don't know, 25, 27 years or whatever. I mean, I have the flu in ages. I don't remember the last time I had the flu. Um, and then I love this. This is a, a, the, the welfare is say, we, oh, we, we're, we're really just like you. We really want abolition. The answer is no, you don't. You're promoting, you're giving out coupons for Applegate bacon. You ain't an abolitionist. Whatever else you are, you aren't an abolitionist. Um, also, in addition to um, not liking welfare reform campaigns, um, I also have an issue with, uh, with, with single issue campaigns, like the anti fur campaign, for example. Or, you know, this idea, the, 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 you know, the going after campaigning about the Taiji dolphins or something like that. Or, or this, right now, what's going on, you know, the, the, the slaughtering, you know, the slaughtering of dogs in, in China. Um, all of this stuff, these single issue campaigns are really problematic because, again, they, they involve, they necessarily assume coalitions. So what you're trying to do is you're trying to get people to oppose killing dogs who eat meat and who think eating meat, other meat, other animals is fine. So you end up taking the position, which is what these campaigns do, explicitly or implicitly, is they take the position that there's something that is ro more wrong morally about eating dogs than about eating cows, chicks, chickens, pigs, fish, whatever. And the answer is no, it's not. There's nothing, there's nothing different about eating a dog. And, and when I, I, I've had some people say to me, yeah, but they're really nasty to those dogs in, in, in China. And the answer is, I've not been to China. I'm sure they are. But I, everybody who says that to me, I say, have you ever been in an American slaughterhouse? And you know what? None of them has. Because I have news for you. What goes on in an American slaughterhouse, even ones that are blessed by Temple Grandin, even ones that are considered to be, you know, wonderful slaughter, they're hell holes. Every single one of them. Every single one of them. And so this idea that, well, what the Chinese are doing, that's just racist, ethnocentric nonsense. You know, this business that the Chinese are more barbaric, or the, the Japanese, the Taiji, or people who wear fur. I mean, I remember, you know, when I was, when I was a young lawyer, like a zillion and a half years ago, um, I remember um, going and representing uh, people who were doing anti-fur demos. And, you know, they would say all these really hideous things to women walking by wearing fur. And 90% of the time, they were wearing leather. They were wearing wool. There is nothing. Wool and leather, are ever silk, are every bit as bad as fur. 
So what we end up doing is creating these artificial distinctions and say that fur is worse than this other stuff. No, it's not. Foie gras is worse than steak. No, it's not. It's all horrible. And by having these campaigns that skirt the issue of veganism, because people don't want to use the word vegan, they think it's too radical, nonsense, that, that, that the, what you do is by having these campaigns, okay, um, you give the idea that certain forms of exploitation are morally worse than what other people are doing, like the people who are involved in your coalition. That puts out the wrong idea. Um, that's, uh, that's, this is, I love this. This is my friend Wayne. Uh, as a matter of fact, I remember um, the last time I was at, I think the last time I was at Summerfest, um, I shared a suite with Wayne. So, I mean, we go way back. It's not that I, you know, I, I just think Wayne's wrong. I think this is crazy stuff. Um, you know, Wayne talking about victory for dolphins and dolphins safe tuna. What about the tuna, Wayne? Um, you know, and this is, this is HSUS promoting, this is HSUS promoting the idea that dolphins matter more than tuna. Not to the tuna. Um, this is, you know, this, is the, this has been going on forever. Ever since, I mean, I've been involved in this like for 30 some odd years now. And I remember they're talking about the baby seals. I mean, look, the baby seals are really cute. They got those little eyes and they're really cute and stuff. I agree that they're cute. But you know what? So what? You know, cuteness, I mean, the, the, the moral status should not depend on cuteness. There is nothing, it is worse. I mean, if you're wearing wool, then you've got no standing to talk to somebody who's wearing a baby seal fur coat. Sorry. Um, here, I, I love this one. Those who wear fur have no respect for life. That's Joe Stalin, for those of you who are too old to represent, recognize Papa Joe. Um, he, was, he was a badly misunderstood guy. He had a lot of good ideas. Um, but, but, but Stalin, um, St here's Stalin wearing a, wearing a Persian lamb hat and he's wearing a fur thing. You know, that those who wear fur have no respect for life. Like those who wear, wear wool do, those who wear leather do, sorry. These are artificial distinctions, they make no sense. Single issue campaigns are also discriminatory against humans. This is probably the most popular anti-fur poster. It is horribly sexist. It takes up to 40 dumb animals to wear a fur coat, only one uh, to uh, make a fur coat, only one to wear it. The fur campaign, as a matter of fact, I stopped representing I stopped going to fur demos. I said, the hell, you know, you all get, go, want to get arrested, get arrested. I ain't going to be involved because I used to sit there and I used to watch animal people call the most vulgar, vile names to women walking by with fur coats. People wearing wool were like calling women wearing fur hideous names. It's sexist. It's nonsense. The anti-fur campaign is just yet another excuse for going up to women we don't know and harassing them. It is sexist. It is vile. It should stop. Um, here, this is, this is, uh, now look, I like, in, I like Karen, um, uh, 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 yeah, <laughs> I'm getting older, my memory. Um, I like Karen Davis a lot, I really do. Um, she was talking about chickens when nobody else was. Um, Anna and I have known her um, for many, God, she, she was one of the first people we met when we got involved in this thing many years ago. And this is a, this is a, a, a campaign that she has. You know, there's a, there's a, there's a, a ceremony, there's a, there's a, a practice that certain, um, certain Jewish people, mostly Hasidim, I believe, um, practice where they, the idea is to sort of take, get rid of one's sins. And one gets rid of one's sins by taking a chicken and, 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 and transferring the, the sins to the chicken and then killing the chicken. And so I participated, I got, I got asked to go to the Bar Association of the City of New York last year to participate in this discussion about what I thought about the use of, of chickens in the Kaparo ceremony by Jews. And I said, you sure you all want me there? Because like, I, I, you know, I mean, are you sure? I, I mean, as a matter of fact, when she first called me, I said, do you have the right guy? Um, you know, and I said, because it's sort of predictable what I'm going to say about this. And I was horrified because, I mean, I, I listened to Karen and I, I, the other people just show slide after slide of what's going on in Crown Heights, showing, you know, starting the Hasidic Jews, um, you know, doing this. And, and I, when, I, when it came time for me to speak, I said, you know, what's really sort of weird about this is this goes on in a section of Brooklyn in which there are probably 27 sla chicken slaughterhouses three blocks from here. You know, what's the difference? I mean, what, it, and, and I even asked Karen, I said, would you do me a favor and put something on here that says, we're not saying that what the Jews are doing, what the Jews who practice this are doing is any, bad, is any worse than what anybody does. If you eat chicken, if you eat chicken, you know, like, what's it, 
so what's the problem with the Hasidic, with the Hasidic Jews? I mean, you know, I mean, if you eat chicken, like, what's the problem? You know, how, what problem do you have with the Hasidic Jews? And this is exactly the sort of campaign which encourages anti-Semitism because it makes people think that the Jews are more violent than other people. And the answer is, sorry, sorry, you, you're, you're not a vegan? We're all standing shoulder to shoulder as animal exploiters. Um, here's Michael Vick and Andre Robinson. Michael Vick, the gift that keeps on giving to me. I talk about Michael Vick a lot. I think what he did was terrible. And we're going to talk tomorrow morning at 8.45 if I'm awake. We are going to talk about... Uh, Anna gets up earlier. She'll be fine if I'm... But uh, no, we, we will be there. Um, uh, Michael Vick, um, you know, we all get upset about what Michael Vick did. Michael Vick is no, no worse than the rest of us. He, he engaged in killing animals because he derived pleasure from doing so. If you eat animals, if you eat meat, if you eat dairy, if you eat eggs, if you eat honey, what you are doing is engaging in animal exploitation. The best justification you have for doing that is pleasure. You ain't no different from... Uh, Michael Vick. The last round of really horrible hate mail I got from animal people was when I was on CNN and they asked me about Andre Robinson. And they asked me if he should go to jail. He was a kid in Brooklyn who kicked a cat. Didn't kill the cat, he kicked the cat. And so I was asked, do I think this kid should go to jail? And I said, well, I said, to be honest with you, I think what the kid did was horrible. But if we're not going to put every meat eater, every dairy eater, every egg eater in jail, what the hell are we doing putting this kid in jail? What did he do? He kicked the cat because he got a kick out of it. We eat eggs because we get kicks out, because we enjoy it. So, like, we get pleasure. We get pallet pleasure. He derives some, some other sort of pleasure. Who cares what the pleasure is? It's wrong. Um, and I think that these campaigns, I think that if you look at, if you look at the rhetoric, it's like the Taiji Dolphins. It's all anti-Japanese. If you look at the rhetoric that goes along with the Vic, you know, the, the, the Vic criticisms, the Andre Robinson criticisms, they, they, you know, they're vilely racist. Um, the abolitionist approach sees veganism as the moral imperative. This is a quote from Vegan Outreach. Um, veganism is not an end in itself. It's not a dogma or religion. I believe. I, I agree. It's not a religion. Um, or, or a list of forbidden ingredients or immutable laws. It's only a tool for opposing cruelty and reducing suffering. This is exactly what the abolitionist approach rejects. This idea that you don't hit, if you're flexible, you know, if, if once in a while you cheat, you know, if when you're someplace, you know, they bring cheese out, onto, you're at a restaurant, you ask for vegan, but they don't bring vegan out. As a matter of fact, they're, you know, Peter Singer says, if you're at a restaurant and they, you know, it comes out, you know, your dish comes out with animal ingredients, just go ahead and eat it. Because if you make people think that you're, you know, fanatical about it, you'll turn people off. And so therefore, go ahead and eat it. I think that's nonsense. I think that's complete nonsense. I think if you do that, if you're sitting with your friends at a restaurant and you're vegan and they're not, and they bring something out, that's not vegan, and you eat it, what you've just told your friends is you don't take this seriously as a moral principle. Um, uh, these are basically Singer quotes. Um, this, is, um, this is, again, the father of the animal rights movement. Um, to avoid inflicting suffering on animals, not to mention the environmental cost of intensive animal production, we need to cut down drastically on animal products we consume. That does, not, does, that, does that mean a vegan world? That's one solution, but not necessarily the only one. If it is the infliction of suffering that we are concerned about rather than the killing, then I can imagine a world in which people eat mostly plant foods, but occasionally treat themselves to the luxury of free-range eggs or possibly even meat from animals who live good lives under conditions natural for their species and are killed humanely on the farm. That is the father of the animal rights movement, a paternity claim that I dispute. These are quotes from, from Peter about how you don't have to be, you know, that, that if, you, if you appear to be a conscientious vegan, people will think you're fanatical. Interestingly, species is nonsense. If you say, look, I absolutely reject child molestation. I absolutely reject it. Nobody says, well, you're a fanatic about child molestation. I absolutely reject rape. I don't care, like, you know, if, if somebody says no, I don't really care what the circumstances are. No means no. So if that's, you know, and so I, I, that's my, my, you know, I, yes, I'm a fundamentalist. Because I, I get called a fundamentalist all the time. Yes, I'm a fundamentalist about rape. I'm a fundamentalist about pedophilia. I'm a fundamentalist about racism. Yeah, I take it seriously. Okay? And the idea that if you take it seriously, you're a fanatic is nonsense. I was going to say something else, but, um, okay. Yeah, this is, this is PETA. By refusing to eat a veggie burger from a restaurant because the bun may contain traces of milk or eggs, not, 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 not considering even that these things are, are prepared on a grill that meat is fried on, um, you are discouraging that restaurant from offering vegan options because it seems too difficult to task. Please. 
I mean, it's just nonsense. Uh, this is a long quote from um, Nathan Runkle of Mercy for Animals, basically saying that, um, you know, yeah, I think, you know, I, I, I would be a vegan, but I realize a lot of people don't want to be vegan, so I think that they just ought to sort of focus on reducing suffering. That's like saying, gee, you know what, I know a lot of people are racist, and I'm not a racist, but I know a lot of people aren't racist, so I think we just ought to sort of like maybe have racist f joke free Monday or something like that. It's just nonsense. Um, okay. Abolitionists reject this in favor of veganism as a moral imperative. You're either a vegan or you participate in animal exploitation. There is no third option. So no, veg, veggie, veg. Yes, vegan. If, now, I, what I always get from people is they say, yeah, but what if somebody's not ready to go vegan? You know, they, they're just not ready. The answer is you, let, if, it, you, dis, you discuss with them the moral imperative of veganism. If somebody says, look, I hear what you're saying, but I'm not ready to go vegan. You don't say, okay, well then you should go flexible. You should, you should eat cage-free eggs. You should eat crate-free pork. You don't encourage them. You basically say, hey, you know, if you care, if you really care, if you really care, then you, you don't have a choice. If you, believe, if you believe animals are members of the moral community, you cannot eat them, wear them, or use them. You just can't do it. So if somebody says, I'm, I hear what you're saying, and I'm going to do less, then go vegan. The answer is you let them choose. You never tell them that exploitation is a good thing. I mean, what I, what I do lots of times is people say to me, well, I hear what you're saying. I agree with you. I agree with you, but. That is the expression I have heard most in my life. I agree with you, but. Um, and they say, I agree with you, but. Um, uh, you know, but I'm, I just, I'm not ready to go. It's, it's too hard. I say, no, it's, it's actually, if you've got two hours, you can get on the internet. It's like idiotically easy to know what you need. I mean, it's basically, Fruits, vegetables, nuts, grains, beans. You know, it's really not rocket science. It's very easy to go vegan. It's very, very easy, and it's very cheap. It's very, you don't have to, I mean, unless, you, unless you're going to buy processed foods that basically have no nutritive value and lots of salt, um, you know, basically, going vegan is much cheaper than having a diet that's got any amount of animal products in it. I mean, that's, that, again, that's a no-brainer. So I try to explain, I try to discuss it with them. I spend as much time as I can with that particular person. However, at the end of the day, they say, look, I'm just not ready to do it. Should I eat cage-free? I said, no, 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 you don't eat cage-free eggs, you don't eat crate-free pork. What you do is, why don't you do this? Why don't you go vegan for breakfast for, for two weeks? Go there, no animal products for breakfast. Easy, it's easy. Then you see your arms and legs don't fall off, you don't go blind, everything's fine. <laughs> then, then you go vegan for lunch for two weeks. You know, you say everything's fine. Then you go vegan for dinner for two weeks. Then you're vegan. However, I always tell them, but let me be clear. If you want to take that, that's, that approach, then if that's what's going to get you there, do it. But please understand, I am not saying that in that period of time, in that six weeks that you're still continuing to eat animal products, it's not okay. And you shouldn't pat yourself on the back. As a matter of fact, you should be asking yourself, if you really take this seriously, why aren't you willing to make a decision in favor of nonviolence, you talk, we all talk about nonviolence, which is nonsense, while we're all sticking the products of, non, of violence into our mouths. I mean, it's unbelievably hypocritical. But, you know, I think we just have to be direct with people. We have to, I mean, we have, being clear is not being unkind. It is not being judgmental. Being clear is what we have an obligation to do. All right. Um, Okay, the only characteristic that is required for full membership in the moral community is sentience. I don't buy this stuff that elephants matter more because they mourn when, they, when, they, you know, when the other elephants die, or you know, whales matter more because they're more like us cognitively, that's, or, or non-human great apes matter more because they're like, that's nonsense. That is not, that's like saying light-skinned black people matter more because they're more like us because we're white, okay? I mean, this idea that, this idea that that animals matter more because they're like us, okay, is just the anthropocentrism and the speciesism that got us into this mess of nonsense in the first place. So I do not think that any care, what, if you're sentient, I don't care how sentient you are, it's not a matter of degree. If you're sentient, then you, you morally have a right not to be used as a resource. I don't care whether you're a fish that can't do algebra or you're a, you're a, a, a chimpanzee who's got rudimentary skills in algebra. I, I don't really care. It doesn't matter. That's like saying smart people matter more than not smart people. I think most of us would think that that is obnoxious elitism. It's the same thing when you apply it to animals. All right. Um, abolitionist approach rejects all forms of discrimination. 
Speciesism is wrong because it is like racism, sexism, heterosexism, classism. So therefore, if you are opposed to speciesism, you are necessarily committed to rejecting animal, uh, the discrimination against human beings. One of the things that really troubles me, one of the reasons why actually I stopped, I, I stopped working with PETA um, for lots of reasons, but one of the major reasons was the I'd rather go naked than wear fur campaign that they started in 1989. I still remember the meeting at which this was announced, and I said, and I believe, if we are continue to treat women like meat, we are going to treat animals like meat. That sexism, that we have a position, this idea that we don't take a, a, a position about other forms of discrimination is nonsense. Of course we do. We say speciesism is wrong because it's like these other forms of discrimination which exclude member, uh, 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 people from the moral community, full membership in the moral community, based on irrelevant criteria like race, sex, sexual orientation or preference, whatever. So we have a position on racism, sexism, heterosexism, and other forms of discrimination. They are all bad. They should all be rejected. One of the things we do with the abolitionist approach is I will not allow anything on that page. I've got a bunch of moderators who, you know, and basically anytime people put this anti-first stuff with, you know, that has sexist depictions of women or, or starts with the racism, oh, Michael Vick, you know, those, those people are barbaric. Or the Japanese, they're barbaric. Or the people who do caparos. You know, they're barbaric. The answer is, sorry, I don't allow any Semitism on the page. I don't allow racism. I don't allow ethnocentrism or any of that stuff on the page uh, because we should all be rejecting it. And the f uh, this is like the, never mind, that's the PETA stuff. Um, okay. The, but I mean, look, that's got no place. I mean, I, I, I went through that because I saw that there are some younger people sitting here, and I don't know whether their parents like approve of them seeing this stuff. But, but the bottom line is, is, that, is that we should not have a movement with that sort of imagery. That's not a serious political movement, that's a joke, okay? The abolitionist approach, final thing, the abolitionist approach um, promotes nonviolence. The problem is violence. That's the problem. We ain't never gonna get rid of the problem of violence with more violence, okay? If violence were the answer to the problems of society, we would be living in Eden now because in case you haven't noticed, the history of humankind is a history of violence, more violence, and more violence after that. You know, I was giving a talk um, in Canada a few years ago and a woman identified herself as a member of the, Na of the Animal Liberation Front support group. And she said, if a vivisector is using 60 dogs in experiments, isn't it acceptable to use violence against the vivisector to stop the vivisector? I said, let me ask you a question. I said, uh, you a vegan? She said, yes. I said, your mother a vegan? No. She said, but what's that got to do with it? I said, just, just, just bear with me. I said, your mother's not a vegan? No. I said, um, what's your mother? You know, she said, but she, she said, actually, interestingly, she said, she doesn't eat beef. She just eats chicken. <laughs> so I said, okay. I said, so she's actually more respo she's responsible for more deaths than if she just ate beef. Because, you know, you can, you know, chickens are smaller, cows are larger. Okay, so... Um, so I said, um, so your mom eats chicken. How many times does she eat it? A week. She said, I don't know. She said, I don't see the relevance. I said, just bear with me. How many times does she eat chicken? Twice a week? Yeah. I said, okay, fine. I said, your mother's responsible for more than 60 chicken deaths a year. Is it okay to kill your mother? And she said, it's different. And I said, no, it's not. I said, what vivisectors are doing is horrible. I am opposed to vivisection. I would not support vivisection. If killing one rat would find a cure for cancer, I wouldn't support it. I mean, I'm totally opposed to vivisection. But what the vivisectors are doing is no different from what any non-vegan is doing. So this idea that we can use vi I mean, this idea, look, I don't care. You can burn down 10 slaughterhouses right now. You can burn down 10 slaughterhouses right now. And if the demand persists, those 10 slaughterhouses will be rebuilt or 10 existing ones will have their production capacity expanded so that they can accommodate the demand. The problem isn't the people who are producing the stuff. They are capitalists. They respond to demand. They will sell beef if it's demanded. They'll sell bananas if it's demanded. They are indifferent in an economic sense. They're capitalists. They will supply, they will supply whatever demand is being made. The problem is those of us who demand it, not those of us who supply it. We're all complicit, but the bottom line is the primary, the primary problem, us, sorry, <laughs> um, the, people who, the people who demand it. 
Those are, that's what the abolitionist approach is. Anna and I, Anna who helped me do this presentation um, and who has been my partner for many years. She's a very happy woman. Um, and, and, um, <laughs> um, and <laughs> well, you are. Um, okay. And, um, and we, we will be talking about this tomorrow. It has been wonderful to be here with you at Vegetarian Summerfest. My only request is, I hope they change the name to Vegan Summerfest. Peace. NAVS actually has a policy where um, we actually, we don't view quote unquote humane meat, for lack of better words, even as, as having anything at all to do with veganism. And that's why we never have presenters that talk about what's described as animal welfare. We actually have that as a policy. So it's not just coincidence that you will never see anyone um, on our speaker roster talking about that, because we just don't view it as having anything to do with our cause.